you for coming today for a grammar lesson. I'm sure you feel that you left all this behind in grade school and you didn't learn it then. So today's the day you're going to learn grammar. Um, my talk is about language change and some of the implications and complications that accompany it. I am going to focus on one change in the English language that has taken place over the past several decades and that is now nearly universal in speech and is very widespread in writing, but which has taken place largely unnoticed and what some of the implications of that change are. Change in language is constant and inevitable. If it weren't, we wouldn't be speaking English now, or we would still be speaking in the language of Beowulf, Old English, or in the language of Chaucer, Middle English, or in the language of Shakespeare, early modern English. But we are speaking modern English, which at some point in the future will be considered old English. What happens for all of us is that we learn English and we have children. And we find out that our children and then our grandchildren speak in a way that we can't comprehend and is unacceptable for us. And we say, the language has gone to hell. Look how these people today speak, these young people today speak. Our parents said the same thing to us. Our grandparents, unless they were still in Russia or Germany or so on, said the same thing of their children. So, Language is constantly changing. And I want to say at the outset that two things about language. First, there is a difference between the spoken and the written forms of the language. Many linguists believe they are actually different languages. Although there's some argument about that. Secondly, traditionally, the spoken English has changed far more rapidly than has written language. But that may be changing now. For example, how many of you are fluent in the speech of the internet, like instant messaging and um, Twitter? Are you fluent in it? How many of you don't know what the heck they're talking about? <laughs> okay, and if you look at instant messaging and Twitter, you'll see one thing is that it's written, and secondly, that for the most part, it can't be spoken. I mean, how do you speak IMHO or LOL? I mean, people may understand what these are, but you don't speak that way. So language in that sense is changing in written form far more rapidly and radically than it is in spoken form, which is a very unusual shift for us. All that being said, let me talk about this single change that I want to focus on. And as usual, okay, I have two sentences here. And I read reasonably well, so I will read them to you even though you can see them. When you have a lot of children, you don't always start running when one of them falls unless they start screaming or something. This was from Sunny Blues by James Baldwin in 1957. The second, from this year, from one of my granddaughter's open house classrooms, if your child is absent, you should call or send a note to the office once they return, or it will be unexcused. Somebody's shaking their head. These two sentences are traditionally grammatically wrong. I don't 
know if you noticed that or not. And in the first one, you will see one falls is singular. In the second, child is is singular. But they start is plural. And they return is also plural. Now what we have here is they in the first sentence refers back to what is called an antecedent, which is the thing that comes before, which is either an, a noun or a pronoun. The noun antecedent is singular. What follows is plural. The second one, the noun child is singular. They is plural. Now, you notice that, but this, as I said, is virtually universal in speech. And it goes unnoticed by almost everyone. Why has this happened? English personal pronouns are the most complex part of speech in the language. We have three persons. First, I, plural, we. Second, you, you. Third, several forms, he, the male, she, the female, it, the neuter, and one, which is genderless, I call it. And the plural is they. Now, the problem is that we have no singular pronoun, third person, that is non or non-gender specific. So what have people done? They have moved they into a singular position in order to fill a void. This is what people do. There's a problem and something's missing. They make up for it. And what they've done is, by analogy, they have copied what we in English have done with you. As you know, you is the same verb form, singular and plural. Whether it's singular, you are a big boy, or plural, you are very interesting people. It's still the same verb form. And English has simplified, even though it's the most, the personal pronoun is the most complex part of speech in the language, we have dramatically simplified it because we used to have a second person singular pronoun that was different from the plural pronoun. And if you study a foreign language, you know that in most foreign language, in the second person, you have both the familiar second person pronoun, somebody you know well, say in French, to, for somebody you know well, or the formal second person pronoun for everybody else, vous in, in, uh, in French, here we've eliminated the familiar. So we have uh, simplified the, uh, the uh, personal pronoun form, but we haven't found a way to find a pronoun that's, that's non-gender specific. Why did this happen? It's those darn women. <laughs> you know, what we had in the past, if you look back and read or, or hear what people used to say, it was always he. When a student goes to college, he will study one of a very vast number of topics. What happened was, those darn women started going to college. Right now, more women are in college than men. More, there are more women in our country than men. There are more women in medical school than men. There are more women in law school than men. It's even possible, perish the thought, that we will have a female president. <laughs> so, what has happened is we cannot any longer talk about he when we have a non-gendered singular statement before, before that and use 
whatever it is that the, uh, uh, the uh, reference to it. So what have we done to try and resolve this problem? He or she. Now what all languages do is they try to make it as simple as possible. And he or she is a long way of saying something. Second, you may have seen this in writing, sh slash he. I don't know how you pronounce that, she. <laughs> or you alternate he or she, which, did I say he last time? Then it's got to be she this time. Whether you read, write, or speak, you can't remember in speaking, and why should you have to do that in, uh, in uh, writing? Or staying with she to make up for past discrimination. <laughs> okay? But none of these works. So what we need is a third person, singular, non gender specific personal pronoun. Ta da! Her. Okay? Now you might say, what kind of, what, what kind of idiot is this? Just, well, this kind of idiot. So, when you have a lot of children, you all don't always start running when one of them falls, unless her starts screaming or something. <laughs> See how it trips off your tongue? <laughs> if your child is absent, you should call us and go to the office once her returns, or it will be unexcused. Now, listen, but that's difficult to say. It is a little difficult to say, but partly it's difficult because we've never said it before. And notice how it becomes a kind of portmanteau word. In other words, it combines masculine and feminine with feminine getting the greater prominence here. A portmanteau word is the swooshing together of two words. Lewis Carroll was very good at this. You probably heard of the word chortle, which is a combination of chuckle and snort. So that becomes snortle. Uh, chortle. <laughs> so this one is a portmanteau word, a combination of her and him. So what do we get? This is the forms of the first third person singular pronoun. In the subject form, masculine is he, she, it, one. The object form, you know, he hit me, subject form. Uh, I hit him, object form. So, him is the object form. The boy lost his book, first possessive. It was his, second possessive. And as you can see, these are the forms. It, notice in the case of its, Notice how often the possessive form of its is misspelled as a, an apostrophe, which is really an abbreviation for it is. Whereas, interestingly enough, with one, the apostrophe is there. Okay? So, I am proposing <laughs> that we have her, subject form, her, object form, Herms and herms. Look how simple that is and how it solves an incredibly complex and, and frustrating problem. Is this change possible? Now, change happens in language through usage. Usage is when enough people use something, either a word, or a structure, or whatever, that it becomes widespread. Okay? I'll give you an example of this with an expression. How many of you have heard the expression at the end of the day? Do you, this is the one that gets me right now, do you know how often people use that expression? Have you paid attention? So now I put it into your mind. When you listen to somebody on television, keep your ears pricked to see how often people use the expression at the end of the day. 
you will find that at the end of the day, they're using it over and over. An expression from 50 or 20 years ago, which has fallen out of use but may come back, is a level playing field. Remember hearing the term a level playing field? Don't hear it. You used to hear it constantly. We need to make it a level playing field. So, so these are expressions that have come in through usage, and they have been widely adopted. And they may, in turn, in time, fall out. I mean, uh, a number of years ago, before he moved to The Late Show, uh, Stephen Colbert invented the word truthiness. It became a very popular word. People used it. It's such, since then, it has pretty much dropped out. But that is what usage involves. So let me give you an example. This is the word that for centuries was used to refer to an unmarried woman. What happened? Do we still talk about women as misses? No. We replaced it with the word ms. And the word ms was in use, invented long before today. But it really was invented today in around 1961. And then what happened? Some damn feminist <laughs> decided to start a magazine, which you may have seen or heard of, called Ms. Magazine. And it became essentially university universally adopted. So there is an example of usage filtering into the wider population and becoming adopted. So it's only a, a matter of grammar. But again, it, it poses complexities, especially in writing, when we have a structure that should be singular, but is converted to plural in subsequent examples in a sentence. So that is my solution to you. I know you are all going out and start spouting terms all over the place. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>